Well, it's not too hard to just turn one page back to Luke chapter 1. If you need a Bible, you can pick one up, and in the Pew Bible, it's page 1090, and I encourage you to pull out your sermon notes this morning and to take notes. It's in your bulletin. The famous Napoleon Bonaparte once affirmed, if Socrates would enter the room, we would rise and do him honor. But if Jesus Christ came into the room, we should fall down on our knees and worship him. Amen? Amen. Dr. Luke would certainly have agreed with that, frame, that famous French general. And as we look at Luke's gospel, chapters 1 and 2, we see the glory and majesty and greatness and beauty of Jesus, the one adored by men and angels. Now for our second week, before Christmas now, our last Sunday, my desire for you is expressed in our sermon title, Meet Jesus This Christmas. That is my longing, that is my prayer. And Dr. Luke, you remember, writes to tell us the exact truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. And his aim is this. Based on the certainty of the gospel, he wants us to enter into a life-transforming relationship with Christ, the only Lord and Savior. And it's my prayer that you too would meet Jesus today, that you would worship him and adore him and serve him and obey him, believe in him, submit to him, all that, amen, so be it. Now last week we were in Luke chapter 1 all morning. We almost finished the chapter, I guess, if you realize that it's a very long chapter, nearly, well, it covers several pages in my Bible at 80 verses. And chapter 1 we saw last week is all about four events leading up to Christ's birth that we just read in chapter 2. That's where we're headed, and I can't wait to get there. And we saw there are wonderful parallels and symmetry here in chapter 1. John's birth foretold, Jesus' birth foretold, and today we continue our study seeing the actual birth event of John the Baptist, and that will be to Zacharias and Elizabeth, and then in chapter 2, Christ's birth. John and Jesus, we said many things in common. There are parallels in chapter 1, but Dr. Luke wants us to see that much greater are the dissimilarities between the two because the Lord Jesus, in fact, is vastly superior to John the Baptist. Jesus is like the sun, John the moon. John is the reflector, but Jesus is glorious God, brilliantly shining in resplendent majesty. John merely points to Jesus' glory. So chapter 1 is building now to chapter 2, but let's finish chapter 1 first. And we're still under event number 3 in your notes, the visit of Elizabeth by Mary, verses 39 to 56. We have these birth narratives, and the two mamas come together in the middle of the chapter, Mary pregnant with Jesus, Elizabeth visited by her pregnant with John the Baptist. And while there, Mary gives what we call the Magnificat, the first uh, Latin word. It is an outburst of praise to God. And from last week, we said the Magnificat has three sections. First, what God has done for Mary, we saw in verses 46 to 49. Second, what God has done for us, verses 50 to 53. And for today, we continue with that, with that third section. Now, what God has done for Israel. Notice with me, verses 54 and 55. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his offspring forever. What has God done for Israel? Well, he's remembered his compassion. He's poured out his compassion on his people. He's kept his promises. He's given help to Israel, his servant, Salvation, you remember, is to the Jew first, Romans 1.16. Matthew 1.21, speaking of Jesus, he will save his people from their sins. The Lord will keep his promises to Abraham and the other patriarchs. National Israel will even yet bring blessings to all of the nations. God is not finished with her yet. From her came the Messiah. Her role is not yet accomplished 
in redemptive history. Now notice verse 56, and Mary stayed with her, that is Elizabeth, for about three months and then returned to her home. Either Mary stayed with Elizabeth up until right before John was born and then leaves to not uh, be overwhelmed by all of the festivities, or perhaps she heads back to Nazareth right after the momentous event of John's birth. At any rate, we come now to our fourth event leading up to the birth of Jesus. Notice your sermon outlines. Event number four, the birth of John the Baptist to Zacharias and Elizabeth. And this covers from verse 57 down to verse 80. And allow me to read for you first verses 57 to 66. Now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth and she brought forth a son. And her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy toward her, and they were rejoicing with her. And it came about that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to call him Zacharias after his father. And his mother answered and said, No, indeed, but he shall be called John. And they said to her, There is no one among your relatives who is called by that name. And they made signs to his father as to what he wanted him called. And he asked for a tablet and wrote as follows, His name is John. And they were all astonished. And at once his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed. And he began to speak in praise of God. And fear came on all those living around them. And all these matters were being talked about in all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them kept them in mind saying, What then will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was certainly with him. So now, as we see in the narrative, God keeps his promises to Zacharias and Elizabeth. And God always does. Don't forget that. We as Christians are people who cling to the promises of God. Despite everything that we see going on in this wacky world of ours, this cockamamie country and even state of California, we believe God. And we believe his promises and we cling to them because God always keeps his promises. And so his favor rests abundantly upon Zacharias and Elizabeth. He sends them this baby boy as promised. Now listen, the Jews always welcomed and looked upon children as a wonderful gift from God. In Psalm 127, verse 3, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. See Psalm 127 and Psalm 128. Children are a blessing. And you see, the nation of Israel was unique in welcoming this blessing from God and, and unique in not following the horrendous practices of her pagan neighbors who aborted and abandoned their children. And when you think of our own nation and you consider the literally tens of millions of babies that have been aborted in the United States alone, approximately 50 million babies since 1973, approximately 1.5 million every year. You see how far we as a nation have wandered from God's good and righteous way. How does God put up with us? How long is he going to be patient with us? I don't know. Dr. E.T. Sullivan once put it like this. The greatest forces in the world are not the earthquakes and the thunderbolts. The greatest forces in the world are babies. Isn't that amazing? And we may have the big one come yet to L.A. We may become L.A. Island, right, or something like that. But that doesn't matter. That doesn't compared to all that God is doing and that he's doing here in our narrative through the blessed children that we read about. Now John's birth, our passage tells us, is of such widespread interest here among Elizabeth's family and friends and no doubt Zechariah's too. And here's their conclusion. The Lord has displayed his great mercy toward her. And many come to share in Elizabeth's joy. Now on the eighth day, they come to circumcise the child. And following tradition, a baby boy would be named after his father or after someone else in the family. And Elizabeth says, uh-uh, no, sir. And she shocks the relatives and the neighbors by insisting that the name be John. 
Huh? None of your relatives has that name. Call him Zacharias after his daddy. We'll do the job for you. And against Elizabeth, well, they'll just let Zacharias, the man of the house, settle the issue. Verse 30, 63, rather, he writes, his name is John. See, he didn't name him. God named him. His name already is John, and that settled that. And immediately now, God opens the old priest's mouth. He has been silent all of these months. Now imagine that. I mean, it's hard for me to be silent more than about five seconds. But for months and months, and now fittingly, his first words after all this time are words of praise to God. Wouldn't that be great if you and I would just shut up until we open our mouth to praise God? Oh, I'll tell you, that would keep me from much sin in my life. That brings us to Zacharias' prophecy about John in 67 to 79. And this section is now known as the Benedictus because its opening word in Latin is just that. And it can be divided into four sections. First, Zacharias gives thanksgiving for the Messiah. Notice verses 67 to 70. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying... Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. This is prophecy. Don't forget that. It's spoken under the illuminating guidance of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, Zacharias will see and say things that otherwise would have been unknown to him. God reveals it to him and through him to us. You see, Luke is emphasizing that the history of Jesus, including that of his forerunner John, is controlled by the sovereign God. He, the Lord, is the one originating and guiding all of this. God is at uniquely at work in the birth of both men, John here and then Jesus in chapter 2. John and Jesus are not any ordinary men. God himself has ordained and ordered their births and their destinies. And that's what Luke is emphasizing. Almighty God is showing his control here by predicting their births in advance and then predicting what these men will do and what they will become. And don't forget, God can say what is going to happen because he controls what will happen. He's only telling us what he's going to do and has determined to do. And he's in charge here. And these births and subsequent lives are God's work, predestined, ordered by his sovereign will. Don't forget that. This world is not out of control. Your life isn't just happening to you. God is ruling and his sovereignty rules over everything, every event, every molecule, universe-wide. And only God could bring about these humanly impossible births. First comes the truly miraculous birth of John to an infertile mother and both parents who are aged. This is God's work, the God of the impossible. Don't forget that. And his hand is on John's life, and he will prove that by predicting and controlling what John becomes in the years ahead. So Zacharias prophesies. And the first thing he does is praise God for his redemption, his salvation of his people through the Messiah. In verse 69, notice it there, a horn of salvation. That symbolizes God's power, his might, his victory through Messiah. Now, Zacharias is not referring to John because this one that he mentions is raised up from the house of David, from the tribe of Judah, whereas Zechariah and Elizabeth were from the tribe of Levi. So he's talking about Jesus, the Messiah. Messiah comes in fulfillment of prophecy. God is working out his plan. And then next, Zechariah speaks of the great deliverance that Messiah will bring when he comes. Verses 71 to 75. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham our father to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. So God is not going to go back on his sworn oath to Abraham. He does keep his promises. His covenant will be brought to consummation. And through Abraham's seed Messiah, all the nations 
will be blessed. And look around this room because you and I are proof of it. We as Gentiles in the United States of America, thousands of miles from Jerusalem, here we sit, here we gather to worship the King of all kings and Lord of all lords in fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. God keeps his word. Through Abraham's seed Messiah, all the nations will be blessed. And specifically, God will deliver Israel from her enemies so that Israel can serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness. And in the third section then of the Benedictus, Zacharias tells us of the place of John the Baptist in all of this. Now we might have thought that Zacharias' prophecy would be all about his little boy. But you see... He surprised us by beginning with the Messiah whom God was about to send. Now he speaks of his precious John and prophesies the child's future. Notice verses 76 and 77. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his way, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. See, John will be the prophet of the Most High. There has not been a prophet from God for 400 years now. God is breaking his silence. God is doing this momentous work. Not just a prophet, but the forerunner of Messiah. Finally, Messiah is coming. And John is going to prepare the Lord's way as his forerunner. Specifically, he's going to tell the people about the coming of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. He is going to call them to repentance as we saw last week. John himself is not going to save people. He will call people to repent and he'll point them to the one Messiah, Jesus, who could save them. Behold, behold, right? Behold, he's going to point to Jesus Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now where will this salvation come from? Verses 78 and 79. Because of the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise from on high will visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace and so we can rejoice in this Christmas season that Jesus brings light to those in darkness you and I in Christ we're no longer blind we've been set free Jesus is the light of the world God has opened our eyes and opened our hearts and now we see and we can say whereas I was blind now I see I know And then Luke closes out chapter 1 with this brief summation of John's growth and early life and the child continued to grow and he becomes strong in spirit and he lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Turn the page because now we go to chapter 2. And the famous Christmas story, it's such a beloved part of Luke's gospel and that's now point five on your outlines. Notice event number five, the birth of Jesus to Joseph and Mary, covering verses 1 to 21 of chapter 2. Allow me to read the first section to you, verses 1 to 7. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and family of David in order to register along with Mary who was engaged to him and was with child while they were there the days were completed for her to give birth and she gave birth to her firstborn son and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn now there are some really important lessons for us from this first section and the first one is this God alone, don't miss that, God alone can meet man's greatest needs. Only God can meet our greatest needs. Now let me explain what I mean. Did you notice in verse 1, Jesus was born during the reign of which man? Well, there it is, Caesar Augustus. 
And I need to tell you a little about him so I can make this point and bring home this truth to you. He was the grandnephew of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar adopted him as his son and heir. Augustus was, in fact, a wise administrator. He was a famous organizer. He showed superb tact in dealing with his subjects. For example, as he conquered provinces, he would allow them to retain significant self-rule. He respected their customs, including their religious customs. During his benevolent rule, there was hope and optimism that spread throughout the entire Roman Empire. These were great days. More than any of his predecessors, he raised the expectations of what a leader could achieve, what a society could accomplish. In fact, it was Augustus who first took the Greek word for gospel or good news and applied it as a label for this new world order that his rule was representing. Temples were erected in his honor. He accepted for himself the title Pontifex Maximus. He was a humble man, I guess. Highest priest, head of all religious worship. And many believed that his stable and enlightened rule would last forever. This is a great, exciting time to be alive under Roman rule. The famous Pax Romana, Roman peace, had been in effect for over 20 years. What needs were there? All was peace and all was order. The Stoic philosopher Epictetus made this wise observation. While the emperor may give peace from war on land and sea, he is unable to give peace from passion, grief, and envy. He cannot give peace of heart for which man yearns more than even for outward peace. No man especially a pagan ruler, can meet the deepest needs we have as human beings. Peace of heart. Peace from inner struggles with guilt and sin. Peace with God. No human ruler can give that. God alone can meet man's greatest needs. Salvation from the sin that separates us from God. A reconciliation with God, our Creator and Lord, who is offended by our rebellion and our wickedness. Only God can solve that problem. Peace with God through Jesus Christ brings the experience of true peace of heart, true inner peace. And God, knowing our greatest needs, salvation from sin, salvation from death and hell and Satan's rule, God sent his own Son, Jesus Christ, to rescue us, to bring us into a joyous relationship with himself. That's what God did. And we who trust in Jesus to save us have all of this. Praise God. Now there's a second lesson from this section, and it is that God controls history. He controls history. Don't miss it. Caesar Augustus was ruling, but God was in charge. The history of Jesus Christ originates with God who guides all events as the sovereign Lord. And we've already noted in chapter 1 how God predicted the birth of Jesus. And I say it again, he can foretell what is going to happen because he determines and controls what is going to happen. President James A. Garfield used to call history the unrolled scroll of prophecy. Isn't that good? See, God predicts it and then he just kind of unrolls it as he predicted it, because he rules. Now further, he ordains and orders all of these circumstances in chapter 2 to fulfill his sovereign will. Caesar Augustus, as a good and methodical administrator, has instituted this regular census of the entire inhabited world, verse 1. That is, the populated world as far as it was ruled by Rome. And this was a registration for the purpose of taxation. It occurred every 14 years as ancient documents attest. You see, in this way, the God who controls history would bring the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy in Micah 5 2. Do you remember it? But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrata, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. In other words, according to prophecy, the eternal God must be born in Bethlehem. That's what God has determined. But Mary lived in Nazareth, in Galilee. 
And I ask you this morning, why would any pregnant woman in the last days of her pregnancy ever make an 80-mile trip through rugged terrain on the back of a donkey under primitive conditions? We're not dumb. No one would do such a thing except to fulfill a Roman census with her husband. They are compelled by governmental rule and they are compelled by God's hand, God the sovereign Lord. Now, not only would the Roman census get them to Bethlehem, but further, it will establish for all time the Messiah's line of descent, his family tree. He must be from the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49.10. He must be from the family of David, 2 Samuel 7, 1 to 7. And sure enough, his legal, though not his biological father, Joseph, was of the house and family of David, verse 4. And Mary, too, was of the line of David as her genealogy in Luke chapter 3 makes clear. And so I say it again, God controls history. Now, by the way, Bethlehem means house of bread. And don't you agree with me? That is the ideal birthplace for Jesus the bread of life. I think that's so amazing. Don't forget his great I am statement in John 6, 35. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger. And I say to you this morning, go to Jesus by faith right now and he will satisfy your deepest longings, your deepest spiritual yearnings with himself. He will satisfy your spiritual hunger. But only he can do it. Only Jesus. Now in verse 7, Mary gives birth to Jesus, her firstborn son. And it is a virgin birth. It is a uniquely miraculous birth, a supernatural birth pointing again to the sovereign God who can do the impossible. And Luke says matter-of-factly that she wrapped him in cloths. And we understand then that mothers in that day swaddled their infants in long bands of cloth to give the limbs strength and protection. And then comes the shocking remainder of the verse that we've become so familiar with that it, it no longer moves us anymore. We're just so accustomed to it. Mary laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, think with me for a minute. God came to earth. God. He came to earth and they didn't have enough room for him at the inn. So he was born in a lowly stable, a place where animals were kept. And then he was placed in a feeding trough out of which animals would normally eat. Now, we're so accustomed to that. But dads, would you want your wife giving birth in a stable? Moms, Seriously, would you want to put your newborn baby in a cattle trough? This is God we're talking about. That should shock us. Maybe we've just gotten too accustomed to it. And Jesus shows us that though God is immensely great, yet God humbled himself to save us. God the Son condescended and made himself low and he came as a servant as a slave second corinthians 8 verse 9 paul says for you know the grace of our lord jesus christ that though he was rich yet for your sake he became poor that you through his poverty might become rich that is something amazing isn't it and that is something to celebrate and that is something to praise God for such amazing humility if God was willing to so greatly humble himself can you not humble yourself before God how dare you walk in pride before Almighty God. How dare you walk in rebellion against Him, this great Lord and Creator? Why would you not admit your great sin against Him and repent today if God would humble Himself to save you? 
Can you not admit your great need for the Lord this day? Can you not call on him to save you since you cannot save yourself? When are you going to give up the battle against God? Humble yourself today, right now, beneath the mighty hand of this compassionate and loving God. Follow Christ's example. Learn from him. Copy him. Jesus is our greatest example of humility. Christ humbled himself and he served and he came down from the glory of heaven in the incarnation and he lived a life of service. He tells us that even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve. And what did he do? To give his life a ransom for many to pay the price for our sins. The ultimate service he gave is that he was crucified in our place. And then Paul, you remember in that passage I'm alluding to, Philippians chapter 2, in verses 3 and 4, he calls us to humble ourselves and serve. And that means on this Christmas season that nothing and no one is beneath you and we're called by God to think of others as more important than ourselves. And who models that? Jesus Christ himself. Follow Jesus' example. And humble yourself. If you don't even know what this humility is all about, humble yourself before God and call on him to save you through Jesus, his son. And he will. Now back in our passage in Luke 2, our next section covers verses 8 to 21, and I want to read it again to you. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men whom God has favored. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement that had been told them about this child, and all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. And when eight days had passed, before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. The first announcement of the Lord's birth is given to some anonymous shepherds. And we got to think along with the story and we got to ask ourselves, why shepherds? We're used to the story. We've had our own time to shine in maybe Christmas plays and some of you dressed as shepherds and you've seen your kids dressed as shepherds. Why shepherds? Why not kings? Why not priests and other religious rulers? Why not the wealthy? Why not the high and mighty? Why shepherds? Well, by first visiting shepherds, God reveals his grace, his undeserved favor toward mankind. You see, because in their day, the shepherds were the outcasts. They were a despised class of people. Their work around animals not only made them ceremonially unclean, but it kept them away from the temple for weeks at a time so that they could not be made clean. And further, they were men excluded from being able to give testimony in the courts. They were so distrusted. They were seen as really the, uh, the low life, unreliable, kind of the, the scum of society. But the gospel goes to them first. <laughs> because you see the salvation to be found in Jesus is for all people it is a universal offer God in effect says if I can save shepherds I can save some of you also from your sins I will if you repent and believe <coughs> by the way I think it's fitting 
also that shepherds be the first group to join Mary and Joseph in adoring Jesus. Because Jesus came both to be the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep, John 10, but also the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John chapter 1, 29. Now in our narrative, first one angel appears and gives a joyous announcement, and then a chorus of angels join him and give this anthem of praise. And the whole purpose of the plan of salvation is glory to God, God exalted, God magnified, praise him. That's the whole point. In fact, that's the whole point of the universe is the exaltation of God. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's all about God. It's all about the glory of God. That's why you and I exist. That's why there is a universe. This universe does not revolve around you or me. We're not the most important. God is. This is all about God. And in verse 10, again, do not be afraid. One of the key comforting sentences that we've seen throughout the Christmas story. Because here we have sinful people facing radiantly beautiful, perfect beings, these angelic beings who come straight from the presence of God. And who wouldn't fear such glorious, holy creatures as angels? And yet verse 10, Behold, I bring you good news. The angel is a preacher of the gospel. And it's this worldwide gospel, good news for everyone, a great joy which will be for all the people. And here's the good news, that God is at work to bring salvation once and for all. And he's going to do it through an actual son of Israel who could be found that very night in the city of David, wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Now, good thing he told him where to look. Because who would ever think to look for God, as I said, in a manger? No, no, no. He's got to be in Jerusalem. He's got to be in the palace. No, no. No, he's in Bethlehem, and he's in a feeding trough wrapped in cloths, probably surrounded by some stinky animals. Now, notice what the angel says about the newborn child in verse 11. Three important names. One, Savior. The one who alone can rescue us from sin and misery and death and separation from God. The one who brings the blessings that will meet all possible human needs. Secondly, verse 11, he is Christ, the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Messiah or Mashiach. The anointed one, the chosen, God's appointed, authorized, empowered man, the God-man who brings salvation. And third, verse 11, he is Lord. And that is a staggering title, he is Lord. Because already in just a little more than a chapter, Luke has recorded the use of this word nearly 20 times as the regular title for God. So when you call Jesus Lord, you know what you're calling him? You know what you're saying about him? You are saying Jesus is what? Jesus is God. Jesus is who? God. And in our narrative, the shepherds hastened to Bethlehem to see Jesus. One man called this the first Christmas rush. Do you feel like you're rushing a little bit this month? You know, get all those presents and buy them and wrap them and hide them under the bed or whatever you do, you know, and we're rushing nearly every night. Yesterday we were at an amazing concert down at Grace Community Church, but that was just a long line of nearly every night. You know, you and I were all out doing things, right, in the month of December. And yet, this first Christmas rush, far different from those sad Christmas rushes that we see today. It's like you see the people and they almost look angry and they're so sad and bedraggled and you want to say, hey, look up. This is all about Jesus. Don't forget. Don't get distracted. It's all about Jesus and God's way of salvation through Christ. Now, these shepherds are examples to us because they receive God's message by faith as he sends it, and then they respond with immediate obedience. After finding Jesus, they report the good news to others. And then verse 20, they go back to their same old jobs, but they are now new men. Now they're glorifying and they're praising God for all that they've heard and seen. They would never be the same. And you and I are never the same once we meet Jesus. And oh, may we copy these shepherds today 
and take to heart this great news about Jesus and then seek him with haste. And if you do that today, perhaps for the first time, then you too will find joy in Jesus Christ and you too will become a proclaimer of the good news. You will be a praise giver to God and you will not be able to help but proclaim what you have seen and heard. That's why Christians are so annoying. They just talk all the time about Jesus. And maybe you're sick of it, but maybe now you understand a little better why you, a non-Christian, have so many Christians talking to you. Maybe your family, friends, because we just can't help but talk about the one that we know, our greatest life and joy. And we end with verse 21. Let me reread it. And when eight days had passed, before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given him by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Under Mosaic law, God had ordained that a son should be circumcised on the eighth day after his birth, after his birth Genesis 17, 12. And so Christ, born under the law, Galatians 4, 4, he kept the law perfectly. And in obedience to angelic revelation, he is given the name Jesus, meaning Yahweh the Lord saves. Yahweh the Lord is salvation. And what this means this morning is that God's salvation has come in the person of Jesus Christ. It has come. And you see, that is good news. That is gospel. That's what gospel means. And God tells us today to believe his good news, to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. He's the good news. And those who do experience his joy and naturally they want to express their joy to him in praise. Now today then it's not sufficient for us to just say that Jesus is a savior or even that he is the savior, however good that is and true. From last week with Mary, we have to say, my spirit has rejoiced in God, my savior. Luke 1, 47. So there you have Jesus Christ. He is Savior. Have you trusted Him? He is Lord. Have you submitted to Him? Meet Jesus this Christmas. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, these are precious and wonderful words. These are glorious words. Good news of your salvation through your Son the Savior and Lord. Yahweh does save. Yahweh is salvation. We know it. We who have been saved, we who are your people, we Christians here, we know of your salvation. May this be a glorious day of salvation for others as well. Some perhaps here who have not yet called on the name of the Lord, but you promise them if they do, they will be saved. Jesus is mighty to save. Jesus is Lord mighty over all of our enemies and omnipotent, powerful, infinitely powerful to rescue all who call on him to meet our deepest needs with himself. He is the Christmas gift that you've given to us. And we rejoice, Father, at such love. And may some this day realize the greatness of your love and grace and embrace Jesus and find life and forgiveness through repentance and faith. For all of us, may this story never grow old. May you stir up our hearts today and bring joy and satisfaction and hope through your Son. And may there be real celebration because of Jesus. He is worthy. And we pray in his glorious name. Amen.